I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you updates from Bakhmut, discuss the appalling war crimes committed by Russian troops in Ukraine with our global health correspondent, and we do another deep dive on Republican Party politics and opinion on the war in Ukraine with Stuart Stevens, a former top Republican strategist who worked on a number of presidential campaigns. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 17th of March, one year and 21 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our associate editor Dominic Nichols, our assistant comment editor Francis Sternley, our global health correspondent Harriet Barber, and our guest is Stuart Stevens, an American political consultant. I started by asking Dom for the latest updates from the battlefront. Well, hi, everyone. Hi, David. So let's start in back moot. So today's British Defence Intelligence report is saying uh, in recent days, Russia and uh, Wagner Group forces have obtained footholds west of the Bakhmuta River. Now, that is the river that runs through basically the centre of the city or what's left of the city. And up till now, Wagner and Russia have held the, held the north and south of the city and east of that river. UK Defence Intelligence saying today, quote, over the preceding week, the river had marked the front line. Ukrainian armed forces continued to defend the west of the town. However, more broadly, this is their uh, defence intelligence continuing. However, more broadly across the front line, Russia is conducting some of the lowest rates of local offensive action that have been seen since at least January 2023. This is most likely because Russian forces have temporarily depleted the deployed formations combat power to such an extent that even local offensive actions are not currently sustainable, unquote. Now, okay, fine. We've sort of talked about that recently, about how there's there's a lot of artillery duels up and down the line across the country, but but no great trading of ground. What I would say about that that comment there from Defence Intelligence is, I mean, you know, blah, 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 no, no offensive action or lowest rate of offensive action since January 2023. I mean, that's not that long ago, fellas. It's only six weeks ago or or so. So that's that doesn't say a huge amount in and of itself, but it is consistent with other reporting. So, for example, on Wednesday of this week, Colonel Dmitry Kivsky, who's a spokesperson for Ukrainian forces in the south of the country, around the Hezon region, he said that daily Russian ground attacks had decreased in that area from around 100 a day to around 30. And I would also refer you to the Transatlantic Dialogue Centre based in Kiev. We've, we've spoken to them many, many times. They produce weekly reports and maps of all the shelled, all the shelling going around the country. And you can compare them week for week. And if you look at the map for the week that ended last Sunday, the most, the most recent one until this weekend, but the, the map up to last Sunday shows that shelling is very heavy in the Donbass a bit elsewhere around the country, but virtually nothing down in the Hezon region, which does all these things together, notwithstanding that comment from Defence Intelligence that, you know, January 2023. But it's all it's all consistent with this idea that Russia is low on ammunition and where they're not low on ammunition, they are low on combat capabilities, so tanks, infantry, all the other bits and pieces, so that they don't want to use what's what limited ammunition they have if it's not even they can see it's, just, it's not worth it so it, it is consistent with what we've been seeing recently we don't have such a clear picture of the other side of the U- ukrainian side because they are they are very uh reticent to give forth that kind of information but it, it's all it's all in all in the same line now separately next thing slovakia Slovakia said it's going to donate 13 MiG-29 fighter jets to Ukraine. So that was the Slovak Prime Minister Edward Hager. He said this morning, and also he said Bratislava, that they're going to send, well, they're going to deliver a Cub medium-range surface-to-air missile system to Ukraine. So this thing's got a, it's quite old, but range of about 15 miles goes up to 40,000 feet. It was later. It's, I mean, it's very, it's capable. It's old, but capable. Yeah, there, there are some of us out there. <laughs> 
that inhabit that phrase. It, it was later developed into the book, and I and I well, you, you will be familiar with that because I raise it, it was the book that Russia used to shoot down Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 over the over Donetsk in July 2014. You'll remember that killed all 283 passengers and 15 crew. That was the book which came from the the cub that Slovakia has uh, has donated. Now, if you think that was all a very tenuous link to to remind you of uh, Russia's actions in, in downing Malaysian Airlines MH17. Good morning, comrades. Then you're absolutely right. And I'll take a pause there. Thank you very much for that, Dom. Francis, can I come to you next? What have you been looking at this morning? Well, thanks, David. Yes, I want to talk first of all about Slovakia. I think this is a very interesting story because, of course, the, the issue of, of fighter jets to Ukraine now has been rubbing on for some weeks. I was quite struck by the remarks by Ben Wallace several weeks ago. He was speaking to Times Radio and he talked about how Britain particularly was very keen to ensure that these Soviet MiGs were able to be delivered from Eastern European countries to Ukraine and was talking about backfilling those planes if this were to take place. And there is no evidence that this has actually happened. But as I say, it, those conversations were clearly ongoing. And so I think it will be interesting to see whether there is any movement or perhaps announcements from Downing Street in the coming days. I should say that it was almost a year ago that President Biden vetoed a similar backfill proposal with Poland. Now, Poland have also said that they will be sending a dozen MiG-29 fighter jets. So, Something is happening here and whether it, they, these Eastern European countries have decided to act on their own initiative or whether it's part of a deal with America and Britain and perhaps some other countries, we don't know. But nonetheless, it's obviously a very welcome one from the Ukrainian perspective because fighter jets are going to be absolutely vital for the spring offensive and beyond. So I think that's an interesting story and one, as I say, we will follow. We're also hearing more this morning about President Xi's visit to Moscow. So details have started to be released. We understand and the schedule will be jam-packed with a one-on-one -on -one meeting set for the Monday, followed by an informal lunch. Oh, to be a fly on the wall in that meeting. Then Tuesday, negotiations are set to take place and the leaders, and this is a quote from the Kremlin, will discuss issues of further development of comprehensive partnership and strategic interaction between Russia and China, as well as an exchange views in the context of deepening Russian-Chinese cooperation in the international arena. They will also sign important bilateral documents. So uh, bear in mind that that statement order almost certainly have had to have been signed off by the Chinese themselves. So again, I think it's quite re revealing of the direction of travel with regard to what they're going to be discussing and what we're going to see and the closening alliance between the two countries. Just whilst we're on China, I do also want to mention that there's been an investigation by Politico into Chinese companies that seem to be operating and sending weaponry to Russia, essentially through the back door. So these entities have seemingly sent a thousand assault rifles and other equipment that could be used for military purposes, including drone parts and body armor, according to trade and customs data obtained by Politico. Now, these shipments took place between June and December 2022, according to this data. And as I say, it's not the Chinese state directly giving weapons, but these are Chinese companies that are affiliated with the Chinese state, as almost everything is in China. And so some are arguing from the, off the back of this that this is an example of where um, China are actually already funneling weaponry to Russia by, it, behind the back door and thus escaping perhaps some of the international criticism that would be directed at them were they to be doing so publicly. But again, I imagine we'll be receiving or hearing more on this uh, in the coming days. Then just lastly, on Clever James Cleverly, the British Foreign Secretary, has been in Moldova in the last couple of days. Of course, Natalia mentioned it yesterday. And he was uh, has announced that there'll be an extra £10 million of British aid for economic and governance reforms in the country, including to the energy sector. And when he was asked by reporters about planned military support to Moldova, Mr Cleverly said, and I'll read the quote, We strongly believe that one of the best ways of protecting Moldova from physical attack is helping the Ukrainians defend themselves against Russia. And seemingly that some of the ways in which they think it would be best to, to do that is, is by ensuring 
ensuring that Moldova is secure, but also that as well the support continues internationally for Ukraine. So uh, that's interesting. I should also add as well, I know I said that that was the last one, but I should add that the grain deal thing is rumbling on too. This pact, of course, is due to expire on Saturday and there's discussions that are uh, still rumbling on about whether there'll be an extension for 120 days or whether there'll be an extension for 60 days. The UN wants 120, Russia wants 60. And again, this is all part of the international brokering and increasing pressure points on issues that, of course, the West and other countries want to see resolved. But Moscow is trying to, uh, I think, strengthen its hand in these negotiations by threatening to do less than what the UN wants. So lots going on, David, as ever. Can I ask you, Francis, you've, you've sketched out Xi's visit to Moscow to meet Putin next week. I think it'd be quite interesting just to hear a little bit about what you think the sort of best and worst case scenarios might be for for international and especially Western and Ukrainian observers? What kind of things would, would they want to hear and what kind of things would they not from this meeting? Well, I think the best case scenario are bland diplomatic overtures about the importance of their relationship, but nothing concrete pledged. I think that would be possible, but I think it's probably unlikely. You don't usually have such an important visit as this without there being quite considerable announcements made off the back of it. So I think it's more likely, and this is more of a sort of leaning towards the worst case scenario, is, as I say, some kind of commitment to further financial support on top of the, obviously, energy purchasing, which has been going on from, from China, filling in the gaps of the sanctions that have been operated by the West on Russia, perhaps even weapons support. I think I think it's unlikely they would go as far as to uh, articulating it in that way. But if you're talking about worst case scenario, that would be that. And I think also as well, just a, 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 there being particularly chummy photographs, you know, and, and, and it being very, very clear, I suppose, a, a clear visual message to the world that Russia and China are in this together. I think, again, that could be very harmful and will will have a, an impact uh, around the world, particularly in the emerging economies where China and Russia continue to sway a lot of influence. And so it's, it's going to be difficult, I think, to register exactly what's good or bad until we see the details. Again, we won't necessarily receive them for some time until afterwards. But um, I think we'll get a pretty good sense of it next week, uh, just from the tone of what we see coming out of it. If I could just jump in there, please, David, I reckon the best we could hope for next week would be some use of language from the Chinese that expresses surprise or disappointment in the in the conduct or the length of the war. Any references to the length of time this war is taking, I think, would be telling because it's clear that President Xi was sold a quick war by um, by Putin, and that's not happened. And China does not want this to, to go on. They don't want the instability. So any references to the length of time, I think, would be uh, would be a, a, a good outcome. In terms of the worst outcome, again, any language from China that frames the war as you know, the US or the West or NATO's fault, anything that, that reinforces Russia's narrative about the cause for the war. I don't expect China to go out and say, yeah, well, it started when 200,000 Russians charged over the border. You know, they're not going to do that. But if they if they frame it in any other way that, that reinforces Russia's narrative, I think I think that would be particularly bad. Thank you very much, Dom and Francis. We're going to go to Stuart Stevens now, if that's all right. Stuart, thank you so much for joining. It's, it's a real pleasure to have you. Would you just introduce yourself to listeners? We can get a sense of your background and what you're looking at. Yes, it's wonderful to be here. I am a, a, a daily listener and a huge fan of yours. I am one of those... Um, evil products of the American political system uh, known as a political consultant, and I'm a writer. I've worked on the Republican side. You only work in America pretty much for one side or the other. I've worked on five uh, Republican presidential campaigns, and my firm has helped elect Republican governors or senators in over half the country. I had a split with the party in 2016 when Donald Trump emerged, and then a greater split when it became Obviously, he was going to be the nominee and wrote a book about the Republican Party with a not very subtle title. It was all a lie how the Republican Party became Donald Trump. And I've been working with a group of uh, kindred spirits, uh, former Republican consultants was the original group um, to try to stop Donald Trump called the Lincoln Project in America. Thank you very much for that. Dom, Dom Nichols, you, you originally made contact with Stuart to bring him on. I know you've got a load of questions. So I'll more than happily hand over to you. 
Great, thanks, Stuart. Lovely to have you on. Thanks for thanks for joining us. I'm really keen. It's almost too broad a question now to say how is the war playing out through U.S. politics because I mean we'll be here all day. But in the in the light of Ron DeSantis's recent comments about the war not being in in the vital interest of the U.S., I'm fascinated to unpack that. And I just wonder what with Nancy Pelosi's recent visit to Taiwan, whether or not there's a moment here for the Democrats to grab the national security agenda, expressing a more muscular, in-your-face attitude to foreign policy that's traditionally seen as Republican territory. Be fascinated on your thoughts on that. What has emerged in the Republican Party um, is, I think, the most significant and really the only major split that has emerged of substance since Donald Trump. Donald Trump came in 2016, ran as an outsider. The Republican Party took the attitude toward Donald Trump that they could control Donald Trump, the Republican Party establishment, I would say. That proved to be, of course, as is always the case, and we can get into the 1930 Germany's analogy, which I think actually are apt here, not to be the case. You know, on January 5th, Ms. Mitch McConnell went to bed, uh, majority leader of the U.S. Senate. On January 6, 2021, he woke up, he was minority leader, and he was running for his life in his own office. Most of the splits inside the party have been over cultural issues, like how much you're going to stress what I would call a bathrooms and bedrooms agenda that someone like Ron DeSantis has been talking about. But now with Trump emerging as saying that he would cut off aid to Ukraine and Ron DeSantis agreeing with him, I think this is a, a profound moment in, in the party because there is still a group of establishment Republicans of which you know I would have fallen into that category. I worked for President Bush in both his elections, 2000, 2004, who feel very strongly that the U.S. should support Ukraine. Condoleezza Rice, the Secretary of State under George Bush, who has been largely silent about Donald Trump. She's a provost at Stanford now and is sort of withdrawn from politics, has come out and said that it would be a, a huge mistake. Miss McConnell, the Senate majority leader, said that it would be a mistake. And Lindsey Graham, who had been one of Donald Trump's chief supporters, has said it was a mistake. But you now, we wake up in a world in which the two leading candidates for the Republican nomination for president are both against cutting off aid to Ukraine. And that is just an extraordinary development for a party that really was formed in its modern edition by Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan standing in front of the Berlin Wall. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. It was seen as the greatest achievement by many of the 80s. The element that the Republican Party was able to contribute to ending the Cold War, bringing down the Iron Curtain. And so just to think that now the pro-Putin element of American politics is inside the Republican Party. Now, you can look at this in one very simple way, and that is, without a doubt, there's, there's no dispute over this now, Russians supported Donald Trump in 2016. It's always difficult in politics to point to causality. How much did that make a difference? We'll never know. But they did. And they've said that they're going to continue to do so. And now you find, uh, after that, Donald Trump is supporting basically the Putin position in the war. He's against Ukraine. That's the Putin position. And now you have his chief rival is supporting the Putin position. So I think you can make a good case. It's the single most successful covert foreign, hostile foreign intelligence action in modern history. They supported Donald Trump. And what did they get for it? Well, they got a lot. It is a moment, you know, to talk about the Democratic Party. There was in the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s a little bit, an element of the Democratic Party that was very hawkish on foreign policy. You remember in 1960, when John Kennedy ran against Richard Nixon, uh, he ran really to the right of Richard Nixon on foreign policy. There was a missile gap. Nixon accused Kennedy of having a secret plan to invade Cuba. Well, it turned out he was right. There were elements like Scoop Jackson, who was a senator from Washington State. They were very hawkish. Uh, even when Ronald Reagan got elected as a Republican, he turned to a still Democratic woman, Jean Kirkpatrick, to be his U.S. ambassador to the U.N. And she was probably the most notable U.N. ambassador to the U.N., except for Patrick Moynihan, that the, who was also a Democrat, that the U.S. has ever had. And if you could have a turn here, where the Democratic Party could once again become a party of strength and seen as being strong on foreign policy versus the Republican Party, that would be a monumental shift in American politics that would 
would change the landscape. Now, will the Republican Democratic Party be able to continue with this? Because there are elements of the Democratic Party that are traditionally less interventionist, let's say, really formed by their opposition to the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War. But we have here, I think, the closest example of a good war that we've had since World War II, where the sides of evil and good are pretty clear cut. Certainly, I think most of us would say. So um, it's it's a fascinating moment, and it makes the stakes for the 24 election uh, of monumental importance in the world. Because without the United States not only giving our aid, but organizing this international coalition, it, it's difficult. You would, you would know far better than I, but how would Ukraine fare? Now, you're a bit of an outlier in the Republican Party, Stuart, with, the, with these views, uh, or, or perhaps how public you've been with them through your articles, etc. I mean, how common do you think these feelings or how, how nervous is the body politic of, of, of the Republican Party at the moment? And if you could, from from there, did, did Donald Trump tap into a sense of disadvantage among American conservatives, or did he did he create it? And are there enough embers still there for a Trump or a DeSantis to breathe life into them? You know, it's a fascinating question. I have taken the position that Donald Trump did not create the modern Republican Party; he revealed it. I mean, my my attitude toward this is that people don't abandon deeply held beliefs in a few years. I mean. It, I don't believe in UFOs. If a UFO shan't land during this show, I'll change my mind. But nothing like that happened. I think that he saw that there was sort of a moral hollowness to the Republican Party and that a lot of things that those of us who worked in the party espoused as deeply held values were really closer to marketing slogans. And he made a deal with the Republican Party if I give you power where you support me, even though I ostensibly am against the core set of beliefs that you have long championed, like character counts, strong on Russia, the deficit matters. Um, All of these things, it's not just that Donald Trump has drifted away from, he is the exact opposite of these things. So my view is that there is a America first element here that is tied to make America great again. And the America First, of course, was a famous slogan of the 1930s anti-interventionist movement in the United States, led by Lindbergh, Henry Ford. And it's a really interesting question. Why is it when much of Europe was going fascist, there was a huge fascist element in America in the 30s? Why didn't America become fascist? And I think the answer is probably because Roosevelt was president. And probably that thing that we used to study and we had civics classes still, leadership matters. So Donald Trump came and he ran against the Iraq war. He ran against the Afghanistan war. He attacked Senator John McCain, a POW hero. He attacked him for being captured. And in each one of these moments, many of us in the Republican Party thought, well, this is it. This is the end of Donald Trump. And in each case, he kept going up. And I think it really forced, or certainly forced me, to look at the party and say, the party is not what I thought it was. We didn't actually believe in this. I mean, I, I felt sort of like the guy working for the financier fraud in America, Bernie Manoff, who actually thought we were beating the market. I mean, I, I believed in this stuff. It turns out it, it really didn't mean much. So I, this is the way that this is going to play out at the core belief of the Republican Party being strong on Russia, strong on national defense, now being challenged, is it, going to be fascinating. One more for me, if I may, before I hand over to Francis and David. So we were talking about the comments by, by Ron DeSantis, the war in Ukraine or supporting right. the war is not in U.S. interest, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, how hard is it for positions taken in the run up to primaries to be subsequently ditched or revised when the candidate is appealing to the wider electorate for the general election? Well, that's a great question. I mean, when George Bush in 1980 ran against Ronald Reagan, he called his economic program voodoo economics, what later became known as trickle-down economics. Uh, When asked about that after he was chosen by uh, Reagan to be his nominee, Bush kind of laughed and said, God, I wish I hadn't said that. And then he accepted the uh, stance of Reagan. I think on something like this, it's going to be very difficult for Ron DeSantis to walk this back. You know, the 
MAGA element, the Make America Great Trump element of the Republican Party, the worst sin is to apologize. The worst sin is to admit that you were wrong. That you know, a quality that many of us were taught was a virtue in life. They will see that as weakness, and they will eat him alive on this. And Donald Trump will never change. Donald Trump never admits anything's a mistake. So I think that you have this situation where DeSantis can't walk this back. Now, there could something happen in Ukraine that might be able to say, give him a cover. But he has said that this is a territorial dispute. And that the United States should be focusing on the problems at our southern border. Which at face value is an absurd statement. The United States military budget is larger than the next nine countries combined. I mean, wrap your mind around that. The money that we're spending in Ukraine is not a rounding area, but it, it is not that far from it. And it is not a question of resources. And there is an element here. Don, I really think needs to be talked about. And that is the Putin vision of Russia is very close to what has become now this campaign in America on the Republican side against so-called wokeness. And a lot of these Republicans, they look at Putin and they see Russia and Putin says there's no gay people in Russia. There are no women in power that you get to see that are in prominent positions. They're all good Christians, and they find that tremendously attractive. And they are drawn to autocrats. They are drawn to strong men. This is Trump's great appeal. So they look at Putin and they go, well, we like this. And, you know, if you look inside of Russia, all the anti-West propaganda they have, a lot of it is over this gender diversity, over this cultural weakness that the United States and the West has. Most of which is just a lie, but they see that as an attack on traditional family values. And there is a unity between that and the Republican Party that is not insignificant. Stuart, thank you so much for your insights this afternoon. It's really fascinating talking to you. This is Francis here. I just wanted to ask, first of all, I, I realise the irony of me quoting Lenin here, but what is to be done? I mean, this is an extraordinary challenge that you pose here for the Republican fraternity. And I just wonder what you think the solution is in the short or long term to trying to resolve some of these contradictions and the direction of travel. I... I you know, I, I, I spent 30 years trying to build a Republican Party and pointing out flaws of the Democratic Party. But I believe the only intellectually honest answer to that is you have to vote for Democrat. Pain is the only teacher in politics. You have to beat these people. There, there is no compromising with these people. How do you compromise with the guy in the Camp Auschwitz sweatshirt standing in the United States Capitol after you attacked it? You can't. And they don't want to compromise. They see compromise as weakness. It's part of their autocratic, friendly nature. You have to defeat them. And just to grasp this, the majority of the Republican Party does not believe that Joe Biden is a legally elected president. So what does that mean? They believe that we live in an occupied country, not a democracy. So the 24 election is the first time we're ever going to have not two parties, with different political views, different ideologies. It's going to be one party running for re-election in what they see as a democracy, and another party, for the most part, running against an illegal occupier in the office. And this is just, it just it's never happened before, and it changes everything. So I think you have to beat these people. That is the only way, and only through defeat will they have a chance to change. And how likely do you think that is come 2024? I mean, I know that a week is a long time in politics, let alone uh, <laughs> over a year. But it does seem at the moment that there is quite a lot of momentum with the Republican Party in the US. And there are quite a lot of predictors here, certainly from the British perspective, that think a Republican victory is likely. I'm just interested in what your analysis is on that. The polling shows Donald Trump beating Joe Biden now. I, you know, Biden won in our system. You know, we have the Electoral College or the popular. Biden won both by healthy margins. And yet, you know, with the electoral vote, it goes state by state. And if Trump had won 44,000 more votes in exactly the right places, 
he still would be president today, even though he lost you know, about 8 million or so in the overall popular vote. So usually in American politics, it comes down to a game of very small numbers. So that's why in the Lincoln Project, it has been our goal to peel 4 to 6% of Republicans off of Donald Trump and get them to vote for Joe Biden. We call that the Bannon line because Steve Bannon famously said if they could do this, it would hurt Republicans. And it turns out he was right. I, I think you have to take it very seriously. And, you know, part of the, the difficulty of talking about this moment in American politics is how not to sound alarmist. And to me, it's sort of like a pandemic. Whatever you say at the beginning is going to sound alarmist, but by the end is going to prove inadequate. And I say this as someone who worked in the party, who knows these people, and as bad as you think they are, they're worse. I think that if Donald Trump is elected president in 24, it will be the last election that will be recognizable as such that we have known in America. I think his model is Viktor Orban in Hungary. This is why conservatives in America are obsessed with Orban. And I think they're facing this democratic change. 85% of Trump's coalition is white. In a country that is 59 to 60% white, and since we've been talking, it's less so, we are headed to become a minority-majority party, majority, minority-majority country. And all the border walls are, are not going to change that. That is just happening. And they see this, and there's two responses to that. As a party, change and do the hard work necessary to appeal to these non-white voters. But for the Republican Party, for the most part, and it was true when I was in it, we failed at that. You know, when Dwight Eisenhower ran for re-election in 1956, he got 44% of the African-American vote. That dropped to 7% in 1964 when Barry Goldwater ran and opposed the Civil Rights Act. You cut to Donald Trump. He got 8%. So you go up, you know, 64 to 2020, one point a year. You got a lot of work to do there before you get to anything. And that has been the standard. And it was our great failure working in the Republican Party. And when I worked for Bush and Mitt Romney, we at least admitted that was a failure. And I think that means something. Whereas with Donald Trump, it has become an embrace of white grievance. And this, this grievance issue is just at the heart of all of this. You know, at, when Ronald Reagan was president, to be born in America... You won life's lottery. There were certainly inequities in America, but you were not disadvantaged by having been born in America. And in Trump world, it's the exact opposite. You're, we're, we're chumps. We're patsies. There are these powerful forces in the world that take advantage of us as America. And he's going to settle the score. And that went to a lot of his relationship with NATO. It, it is a white grievance-based mentality. And when you tap into that and you manage to convince the people in the United States who are the most advantaged, which are white Americans, that they have been disadvantaged and have a grievance, it, it is a very powerful force you've unleashed. And when that has been embraced by a, one of the two major parties, as the Republican Party has embraced it, history tells us it's a very dangerous thing and where it leads. So I, I'm not particularly optimistic. I had sort of a, a going out of business sale in my optimism about the Republican Party. And I, I think there really is one response to try to get people like myself who've never voted for Democrats before in their lives to, to put aside differences on policy and to vote Democratic now because really it is the only pro-democracy party in America. What are your observations about Donald Trump as president? Because no doubt there will be some listeners who will hear what you've said there and will think, well, would there be, have been a war in Ukraine had President Trump been president? Because he was so, so, so much of an outlier, seemed so risky on the international stage. There are some analysts who argue that actually Putin would have been less likely to have taken the risk, that it was actually President Biden's weakness on Afghanistan and with the withdrawal there that led to the war in Ukraine. I just wonder what your respect, response to that would be. Yeah, yeah. I never bought the Donald Trump is a madman, so therefore he's uh, intimidating. Um, look, I, if you go back and you look at what Donald Trump said about NATO and you go to the Helsinki meeting with, with Putin, which is one of the more disgraceful moments, I think, in modern America, 
political history. His calling Putin and congratulating him after he won the sham election. His attempt to leverage Ukraine, but will not give them weapons until Ukraine goes and makes up some evidence about his opponent's son. These are disastrous. And, and Donald Trump just yesterday talked about weakening NATO. So I, I, I think that what happened here is that Putin saw that you had a traditional American president that would stand up and support Ukraine. And the sooner he did this, the better he off would be because it's only going to get worse. We were putting more weapons in Ukraine. So I, 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 I don't think there's any question that if Donald Trump were president today, Russians would have succeeded. There would be a Russian proxy government in Ukraine. There is absolutely no way that Donald Trump would have put together the international coalition that the, uh, the president has been able to and to rally the support that the president's been able to. It just would not have happened. And this is why Russia's supporting Trump in 24. I mean, they're, they're, they're open about it. And, you know, for, for Joe, uh, the, the, the Wagner guy is under indictment in the United States because of his uh, interference in the, the, the campaign in 16. So they're just open about this. So I think that, that, that Putin is pretty straightforward. They supported Trump. They got what they wanted with Trump. They lost with Biden. They felt like they had to move. And one final question from me. You alluded earlier, I think, to this, but I'm very interested in this sort of strand of isolationism in America at this moment. Of course, isolationism has been a sort of political tradition in America ever since dating back to the founding fathers, and it's always lurched to, towards interventionism and isolationism. But why now? I mean, I think to any of us who've been following the geopolitical situation for as many years as some of us have, this seems to be a particularly precarious moment, and not just because of Ukraine, but generally as obviously with the rise of China and everywhere else. Why is it now that America seems to be stepping back, um, or at least within the Republican wing, and so many of the, of, of the American population, it seems, seems to be stepping back from the international stage, do you think? Well, you have to get inside their mind. They do not view America as the greatest country in the world. You know, as we were saying, that Reagan view. They don't believe that. They think that America is in decline. They believe that we should spend all the money that we have protecting our borders, because they really have convinced themselves, largely through Fox News and other really propaganda outfits, that there are these massive hordes that are coming over the southern border and that this is our greatest threat. And there is an integral selfishness here. Why should we help these people? What have they ever done for us? We should be just spending all the money we have. You can, we have roads in need. You go into our cities, they have problems. And it is a inability to see how the United States benefits so from a interconnectedness with the world. In conservative terms, particularly Donald Trump conservatives, globalist has become a great attack point. You are a globalist, which, of course, I mean, America is the wealthiest country in the world because of globalism. I mean... Google, Apple, all the great American countries, they're not vastly wealthy because they're selling things in America or making things in America. It is globalism that has made America the reserve currency of the world. And I think that there's a failure in the Republican Party to, of the leaders to make this argument. And if you don't make an argument and the other side is making an argument and every day Tucker Carlson is going on Fox News and attacking globalism. No one is defending in a loud voice the benefits that we get. I mean, if you believe America is not great now, there's a sort of false nostalgia here that what when was it great? It was the 50s maybe. But none of it really makes sense. But it is part of, you know, what Timothy Snyder talks about, the politics of inevitability and the politics of eternity. 
America used to operate in the politics of inevitability. It was inevitable America was the greatest country in the world. It was inevitable that America would lead the world. The conservatives now are in the politics of eternity, much like Putin is. That it's not about governing, it is about the fight. It is about who our enemies are. And you don't elect politicians to govern, you elect politicians to fight for it. That's why Donald Trump was more popular with Republicans the day he left office after being impeached twice and his followers had attacked the United States Capitol. And we talk about stopping, threatening the peaceful transference of power. Well, for the first time, there wasn't a peaceful transference of power in the United States. People died. And 57% of the Republicans in the House of Representatives voted not to certify the election. I see no reason if Donald Trump loses next time or Republican loses next time, that won't be 75%. So if you wake up in a world and you believe that there are these other wealthy countries out there, they're taking advantage of the United States. Trump at one point was talking about how much greater Canada is. I mean, really? The United States is threatened by Canada? R really? It's come to that? Then it's an inevitable thing that you think, well, all these people are taking advantage of us. All my tax dollars should go just right here. And it's, a, it's an appealing, very simplistic worldview. But I think that those that are on the other side aren't making that argument with enough enough vigor and enough strength. Just one. I know we're just dash, dashing about a bit, Stuart. Sorry about that. Don't don't back here again. Just one final one before I leave to to Francis and David for, for final thoughts. We have in the past had the the office of the president of the United States listen to this pod. Now it might not be President Biden. It was probably one of his staffers bored on a you know, morning coffee or whatever it was. We don't know, but but we know that the. The office of the president has uh, has listened in. So my closing question, if you had one point to make to the resident of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, what would it be? Walk with confidence. This is my problem with the Democratic Party. There has always been a sort of tentativeness, a caution about the Democratic Party. And I think the Democratic Party should go out there with the attitude, we're right, they're wrong. There are more of us than there are more of them. It is ours to have. We are going to take it. This is our moment. And don't try to middle things. You know, the, there's always said in the Republican Party, they have, it has this cleaner message, a more easily to understand message. Well, the reason it does is because the Republican Party is so homogeneous. It is much easier to message to a party that's 85% white and pretty much in, in sync ideologically. The Democratic Party, which of course is its great strength, looks more like America. It has much more division. You have Bernie Sanders on the left, you have Joe Biden, and that makes it more difficult. But I thought the great moment in the 22 midterms was when President Biden went out there and put democracy on the ballot. And everybody said, well, you can't do this because it's going to be about gas prices. It's going to be about grocery prices. And the one thing I've learned in politics is, you know, if you want a public to believe that an issue is important, you have to make it important. And I think that it is critical that the Democrats and the president, he's been very good at it. I think Joe Biden has risen to this moment to an extraordinary degree. What we saw in Kiev just was another one of these moments. They have to continue to put democracy on the ballot and not shy away from saying that this is an existential moment for America to choose. As we said in the Lincoln Project, Donald Trump or America. You can't have both. And I think that's what you got to do in 24. And you got to bet that Americans are going to bet on America. Hi, Stuart. Thank you so much for those answers. You mentioned the, the name Tucker Carlson there a few times. Um, could you put Tucker Carlson and the media like him a bit in context for, for foreigners like ourselves? How, how does he and that, that media sort of cloud fit into all of this? How seriously should we take him? Well, I, I think you should take it very seriously. There, there really are, if you spend most of your time watching Fox, about 80% of that audience believes that Donald Trump should still be president. So that's just such a fundamental divide. Like, 
That means we don't have a democracy in America. And Tucker Carlson, every day, goes out and repeats Putin talking points. What do, wh why should we fight for Ukraine? Ukraine is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. We, we a natural alliance with Russia. I mean, Tucker, Tucker Carlson is shown all the time on Russian television for a reason. And, you know, you had figures like this in the 1930s, like a, a famous radio, American radio host, who was a Catholic priest, Father Coughlin, who would go out and talk about, basically, try to sell fascism. Um, and a lot of this was anti-Semitism. But it, the divide in America now, which is part of a, the world that we live in, where people consume news not to inform their opinions, but to confirm their opinions, which we're all struggling with. And I think that there's been a real crisis in American journalism, that it was that, call it the traditional media, legacy media. It was considered that the greatest good, I mean, you guys know this far better than I, that the greatest good was objectivity. And that really breaks down if you have one side that is not even remotely concerned about telling the truth. So I have great sympathy for my journalist friends. How do you tell both sides of a lie? What is your obligation? And this is something that American journalism has struggled with since 2015 when Trump emerged. If you have someone who announces for president, says he's going to spend all his own money, not take any donations, and yet has a donate button on his website, and 70% of the money that he spends in the first months of his campaigns are donations, but he keeps saying he's only spending his own money, how do you deal with that? Do you just call him a liar? And I think that this has been one of the great problems we've had, that We've learned under the Trump era how much of American civil society is based upon norms and the assumption that both sides will agree to certain norms. You know, I, I worked in five presidential campaigns. I won some, I lost some. But like I worked for Mitt Romney. The night that we lost to Barack Obama, I didn't worry about the country. I, I felt terrible. I felt like I'd let a lot of people down, most notably Mitt Romney. But I didn't go to bed waking up like it's tomorrow, tomorrow is a country in danger. I don't feel that way about Donald Trump. And he is a danger to the country in my view. And that changes everything. And, you know, in our system, political parties really have to act as a circuit breaker. And the Republican Party never pulled the circuit breaker on Donald Trump. When Donald Trump went out and said in December... 5th, I think, 2015, he called for a Muslim ban of anyone entering the United States. Well, that's nothing if it's not a religious test. How do you tell if somebody's a Muslim if you don't ask them what their religion? You know, I mean, what if Cat Stevens shows up and says, well, actually, I'm a Quaker now, not a Muslim. What are you going to do? Like, ask him for trivial questions about, you know, Thomas Chen? The Republican Party should have come out and said, look, if we stand for anything, we are a constitutional party. This is a religious test. We're not going to support this. We can't stop people from voting for Donald Trump. We can't stop people. We can't stop Donald Trump from running. But if Donald Trump does win this, we will not support it. But they didn't. And I know all the reasons they didn't. They were worried that Donald Trump would run as a third party and guarantee the election of a Democrat. And there was this assumption that Donald Trump would change, that the presidency would change Donald Trump. And that never happened and the parallels you know the 1930s germany and france on papen are just so obvious they thought adolf hitler would change how'd that work out and the party still doesn't the, the part of the party that call it the same party the governing party and there still is some elements of that in the republican party they still don't know what to do with donald trump and they looked at ron DeSantis as kind of a savior because Big state governor, went to Harvard, went to Yale, was in the military. That guy can resurrect the Republican Party. Okay, so then you have him come out, and he has the same position as Donald Trump on Ukraine and supporting Putin. 
And I think that it just shows how fast a, a, a cancer can spread. That one of the principles of the Republican Party was character counts. And if you believe that, then you could never accept Donald Trump. And once you do accept Donald Trump, you're saying that no longer does character count, and then you end up where? You end up with a party that now is a large element of being pro-Putin. Stuart, thank you so much for your time. You've talked us through an awful lot there. Can I just ask you for your final thoughts going into the weekend? I mean, if there's one thing you'd want our listeners from around the world, and we do have lots and lots of listeners not from the United States, to take away about about what you've been saying, what, what would it be? I think that uh, overwhelmingly Americans support Ukraine. I think that the courage of Ukrainians stirs something in America so it brings us back to our own roots. We fought a violent war to become a country. They are fighting a violent war to remain a country. And the horrors of what is happening in Ukraine, I think, resonate here in America. And I think that it is critical that that side of the argument win and that this is a decency test for America. It's that simple. And if Ukraine wins or loses, average America may not wake up and have their lives affected. But something inside of all will have died. Because we have the ability to help Ukraine win the war. I mean, we are the only superpower. And we have to continue to do what it takes to ensure that Ukraine wins this war. Stuart Stevens, thank you so much for your time. Uh, just to say that no doubt there'll be lots of American listeners who will be agreeing with you and nodding, nodding along, many others who might disagree. Please do get in touch. We, of course, welcome debates and your thoughts and opinions, especially when we're talking about a country, as you can hear from our accents, that isn't our own. But thank you so much for St to Stuart for your time. I thought that was really fascinating. Dom, I know you have no final thoughts, so I'll go straight to Francis Sternley to finish the week. Francis Sternley. Thanks, David. So much to reflect on today. One thought that occurred to me listening to Stuart is that so often the danger from our own political perspective comes from the other political party, that if so-and-so party wins, that this will be a disaster for the country. But actually, the truth, if one looks at history, is that the danger comes when politicians and the people no longer believe in those political parties, or should I say no longer believe in the system. And that is, I think, something we are starting to see in America, that there are large numbers of people in positions of real influence, and of course, tapping into a popular discontent, that no longer believe in the system as it is currently defined itself. And that is dangerous for the reasons that I think Stuart has very well articulated today. I am an optimist, actually, about America, I should say. And I think that um, there is always room for uh, somebody else to come along to redefine the Republican Party or the Democratic Party and for this sort of temporary danger to be allayed. But, you know, there are instances where that doesn't happen in history, most famously, perhaps the decline of the Roman Republic and its eventual collapse. I think it was the Ides of March last week, actually. But anyway... It is ironic, though, isn't it, that at this time of perhaps scepticism around the system in America and in the West more broadly, there's a lot of popular discontent with how democracies are functioning at the moment, that Ukraine itself is fighting for the principles of those very systems that are being questioned in the West, that it doesn't have the cynicism about democracy as so many in the West seem to, and it is willing to fight and, can, and resist an invasion in order to defend the principles that they of the vision that they want to have for their own future. And so I think that's something just worth bearing in mind that we're in a very fortunate position here. We're having just the very nature of us having this conversation today is it was a privilege and one that has been afforded to us by centuries of struggle from people perhaps far braver than all of us. And that is something that is currently not well, it's kind of something being fought for right now. And um, that's my final thought for today.
Yesterday, I caught up with Harriet Barber. She works on the Telegraph's Global Health Desk, covering humanitarian crises, war crimes and human rights. A few weeks ago, she travelled to Ukraine to interview survivors of the Russian occupation. The stories she heard were, frankly, quite upsetting. And listeners are warned that the following conversation contains descriptions of extreme violence and sexual abuse. Here's our conversation. Harriet, thank you so much for your time. A a few weeks ago, you went to Ukraine for a reporting trip. Can you tell us where did you go and why? Thank you for having me. We travelled to Ukraine to report on war crimes committed by Russian soldiers during occupation. And more specifically, we were speaking to people about the sexual assault and rape of men, women and children. We mostly spent time in Bucha, Erpin and Borodyanka, which are just north of the city of Kyiv and were some of the first areas to be occupied last spring. When you were there, you spoke to many civilians about what they had suffered under the Russian occupation. Um, What were the stories they told you? The the trauma is very raw for the locals who lived under occupation, some of whom were caught up in the fighting, but they were really eager to talk and share their stories. We met two elderly women whose houses had been occupied by the soldiers in February. They really gripped my hands as they were talking and seemed quite desperate to tell somebody about what had happened to them. They'd been forced to live with up to 30 soldiers each. One of the women, who was in her 70s, started crying when she said that they'd killed all of her animals. The other told us how one day the soldiers had taken her and her husband outside and held 10 guns at their heads. Some people were really angry too. We were there exactly one year after an apartment block had been destroyed, leaving 30 civilians dead. A mother and her six-year-old were laying flowers, yellow flowers, for their 12-year-old neighbour who had been killed, and the mother kept saying how they'd been forgotten. We sat in a tavern one afternoon, and we sat by some middle-aged men who were drinking. They got progressively drunker as the afternoon wore on. One was very distressed with his head in his hands, and another slammed his fists on the table at the mention of Russia. And then we started asking about sexual assault. A psychologist described to us how she was treating 17 patients in a handful of villages in the region for sexual abuse and rape by Russian soldiers last year. She said one man had been forced to watch his five-year-old daughter being raped and another woman and her 13-year-old daughter were both gang-raped. We met a woman who told us about being raped in her village. She had been cycling to check on her elderly parents about a month into the occupation when a group of three soldiers stopped her. They dragged her by her hair into an empty house, forced her to strip naked and then two of them raped her while the other shot his gun close to her head so that she couldn't move or run away. And we also spoke to a man, another civilian, who had been detained in Hassan for eight days and was sexually tortured. The soldiers had electrocuted his genitals until he passed out. What are Ukrainian and international lawyers doing about all this evidence? What's what's their plan? So it's the first time during an act of war that prosecutors have started to prosecute some of the perpetrators. Weeks after a liberation of a town, they'll travel there and go door to door interviewing people. The first question they ask is, did the Russians behave? And we're told that at this point, a lot of the stories often come flooding out. The prosecutors then tried to gather as much hard evidence that might be left behind, although not much often is. In some cases, the soldiers have lived in these houses, so there might be a bit of hair on a brush or evidence in bedsheets or a razor blade. But the investigations hang really on descriptions of what the perpetrator looks like and any details which might lead them to identify him. It could just be a first name or the insignia on his uniform. They then take this away and analyse the military intelligence and any photos they're able to find to try and piece together who the perpetrator is. In one instance, the perpetrator was identified by a large bear tattoo on his chest and in another, the offender had used social media on the victim's phone who later saved his data. What did you hear were some of the issues for uh, the lawyers and prosecutors trying to gather this evidence? So, so far for sexual violence, they have 171 investigations opened, have formally identified seven men and found just one person guilty. The information that they're working with is really quite scant. The units are constantly moving. Some of the men will have died over the past year. The soldiers have tried to hide their identities. The victims may only know a first name. CCTV has usually been destroyed and the soldiers confiscate phones on the first or second day of occupying a territory. 
Many, many people are also unwilling to come forward. They fear the judgment from their family and neighbours or that the Russians will return and punish them. Uh, punish them sorry. There's some wariness of the police too, with a system which, before the war at least, was seen to blame the victim. It sounds like a important and rather harrowing trip um, to Ukraine. What were your main takeaways, Harriet? Rape in conflict isn't new. It's existed for as long as there has been conflict, and it's been reported in 17 conflicts that are ongoing around the world, but it often remains hidden under layers of stigma and fear and also political will. It's great to see these prosecutors attempting to hold these perpetrators to account, but the pain isn't going to go away for a long time, and the survivors need medical and psychological support. Harriet, Barber, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear, and today on Twitter, Gemma Fowler.